books this morning and turn to page 115. Let's all stand as we sing Standing on the Promises. to South Fork Church. It's good to see everybody here. Um, we are going to, uh, we got a few announcements that I wanted to share, and then if you have any announcements you want to share that aren't in the bulletin or that you want to bring special attention to, please do that. Um, what I have, there is a takeout sign-up sheet for the fall festival that's in the foyer. So if you would like to help with that if that's something you've done in the past and would like or would like to try this time please sign up uh, is there anything else we need to say about that it's not hard to do it's just no no <laughs> we have a lot of fun on it, it actually is a lot of fun i've done that before and um i'm i'm pretty sure with the uh with the takeout sign up sheet it's broken up into sections so you don't have to do it the whole time. And uh, we do have a lot of fun. So think about that. If you've done it in the past, you know. And if you haven't, then uh, you should give it a shot. But there's lots of jobs to do. So if that's not your thing, I'm sure there'll be something that, that we can, uh, that the Fall Festival Committee can put you on and it will help out the whole effort. The other thing um, that I have is family night is next weekend, and Sherry needs to know if you haven't signed up yet, like I know I haven't, um, if you haven't RSVP'd or let them know that you're coming, they need to know so they can get the food right, to count for the food. So if you're planning on going to family night 
It's uh, the 8th, right? Is that Sunday? Yeah. So it's next Sunday evening, afternoon, evening at Murkison Farm. And if you're planning on doing that, then just let Sherry know if you haven't already signed up. And I think we're going to say something about Operation Shoebox. It's the sort of the unofficial or maybe official start the of kick the, off. the kickoff for the Operation Shoebox. So there's some shoeboxes in the hallway in the back uh, for you to take and uh, fill up. And, is and, also it, the front. and also in the front. Okay. I feel like a stewardess. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I think we have a short video that we're going to play for the kickoff. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. I want every child to know that there's a God. I want every child to know that God loves them, that God sent his son from heaven to this earth to take our sins. We've got a charge to go into the world to make disciples of all nations, to baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. God, here I am. Take me and send me and use me. God laid it on my heart. The Himbas need someone to give them the word of God. My vision for the Salma Khan tribe is that we will share the gospel and to establish a house church here so that they also can receive the, the, the blessing of Christ. Through the gift boxes, we are going places that no church will be allowed. Places like Gambi, that floating village. We are reaching those that have never heard the gospel. We find them having not even a Bible in their own language. Areas of the world where people need to know that God loves them and cares for them and sent his son from heaven to this earth for them. God loves you and God loves me. Operation Christmas Child opened doors to evangelism, discipleship, and multiplication. When a child receives a shoebox, it shows them who God really is and how much he cares for them. We bring gift to the children, also the mothers and the fathers and their brothers and sisters also accepted the Lord Jesus Christ. The churches are using these shoeboxes, the greatest journey discipleship program, to reach out to the ends of the earth with the gospel. God sent his son to this earth on a rescue mission Jesus Christ died and shed his blood on the cross for our sin. And then on the third day, God in heaven said it's enough, and he raised his son to life. This is the good news, and we've got a responsibility to take this message to the ends of the earth. All right, so Operation Shoebox is a way for you to impact the world from right here in North Carolina. It's a really important program that's been around for decades, right? And um, so pick up a shoebox. If you have any questions about what goes in it, you can talk to Phyllis. Are there directions in it? There's directions in the box. So there's how to pack a shoebox and how to leave it out. Okay, so everything's in the box. It tells you exactly what to pack or, or how to pack it. And we're uh, doing our collection here and praying over them on November 12th. Okay, so uh, a little over a month away, November 12th is when we're collecting them all back here. And um, if you've been here before, they'll be stacked here. We're going to pray over them before we take them to um, the facility that will actually package them up and deliver them around the world. Are there any other announcements that anybody has? Okay, so the October 15th um, is Fall for Jesus at our Harvest Hoedown for four years old to junior youth, and that's from four to six. That's in your bulletin, so if you have a bulletin, 
uh, you can circle that. Are there any others? If not, then uh, we always like to have a time where we mention prayer concerns uh, before we pray for our service. And uh, the Sunday school, the adult Sunday school class turned in a list here. Sandra Pickard, Ronnie and Billy Lindley, Phyllis Johnson, Jane Lindley, Pauline Andrew, Misty Barbie, and there was an unspoken. Dwight? Dwight and Martha Lindley? Claire Brady? Okay. Paulette? Jimmy Robertson? Okay. Are there others? Let's stand, and if you're able, and we'll go to the Lord in prayer over these prayer concerns and for our service today. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you so much for this opportunity to come into your house with your, our fellow believers to worship you this morning. This is a time for us to set aside our concerns of the week to focus solely on you and the hope and strength that you provide us. Lord, we lift up these names that have been mentioned, the various needs that they have, physical, emotional, spiritual, and we ask you to work specially in each of their lives. And I know that there's plenty of prayer concerns that we have for ourselves and our own loved ones that maybe haven't been mentioned. For those unspoken requests, we ask for your intervention as well. We ask that you be with us here in this service, that you abide with us as we come to worship you, and you guide those who are leading your worship to offer the message that you want us all to hear. Open our hearts and minds to that message, Lord. And we pray that in all things we do, it may honor you and all be to your glory. It's in your son's name, Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. And while we're still standing, let's take our hymn books again and turn to page 97. Let's sing, There Shall Be Showers of Blessings. There shall be showers of Thank you. 
continue our worship today, I wanted to read you a passage that uh, you're probably familiar with by now. And one of the things you might be somewhat familiar with is that when I find the good passages that uh, the Bible focuses on, sometimes I think repeating those for the sake of, of memorizing and remembering those is helpful. So I want to reread a passage tonight, uh, today, that I've read before, but it's a setup for the message that's coming in a minute. So. I want to reread this passage out of Deuteronomy chapter 6. In Deuteronomy chapter 5, uh, God presented the Ten Commandments to the children of Israel. And then, in, in, in a way to kind of tie it all together and make sure that they focused on what was more important, uh, God says to them this, This is the commandment, the statutes and the rules, that the Lord your God commanded me to teach to you. This is Moses talking to the children about what God told them to do that you may do them in the land to which you are going over to possess it, that you may fear the Lord your God, you and your son and your son's son, by keeping all of his statutes and his commandments, which I command you all the days of your life, that your days may be long. Hear, therefore, O Israel, and be careful to do them, that it may go well with you, that you may multiply greatly as the Lord your God, the God of your fathers, has promised to you in a land flowing with milk and honey. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. These are the words that I command you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children. Talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way, when you lie down and when you rise. Bind them as a sign on your hand and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorpost of your house and on your gates. We're going to enjoy a choir special now, but I wanted to read that to kind of get us thinking about it before the message.
We're going to have a couple of minutes of open worship if you feel like God is laying something on your heart and you just can't help but sing about the goodness of God, then we'll sit and listen. If you want to sit quietly and reflect on the goodness of God, we'll let you do that too.
The song says, all my life you have been faithful. I think it's a pretty fair thing to say that all of our lives God has been faithful. I think it's also decently fair to say that all of our lives we haven't always felt that he was faithful. Is that fair? In some seasons of our life we know it to be true. But we just haven't seen it. We haven't seen the plan. We don't know everything that's going on. And to have the undergirding to know that even in this season of life we don't quit. And having the faith community around us supporting us helps us to keep going until we see the faithfulness again. Until we feel it. There was a song one time that said, Sometimes I don't feel like singing. Sing anyway. <laughs> if you sing, then you're more likely to feel it. And so it's just a matter of doing what we do until we get back to that place. The other thing is sometimes our emotions betray us. And sometimes we speak from a smaller situation in life than we realize. But we serve a huge God. When we let Him lead, and when we let Him be our God, and we let Him, it, it takes that sacrifice. Last week we talked about baptism, which is a huge surrender. It is a huge forsaking of our own interest to allow ourselves to fall back into the hands of the living God. But if we do that, He can create something so much more beautiful and wonderful than we could ever imagine. We've been talking for the last several weeks about some passages being important in the Bible, but some, Jesus said, well, this is the greatest, or God says, this is the greatest, and, and we wanted to focus on those, some of them by the fact that Jesus said this is the greatest, some of them just by where they were. Right at the end of Jesus' ministry, He wants to, to set down for us a commission that's, that's entitled for the whole church, right? And so we've been focusing on those passages. We're going to continue on with that in just a few minutes. But I want to tell you a story. Back in the uh, olden days when I was in driver's ed, how many of y'all remember driver's ed? Some of you a little bit more recently than others. You have two portions to driver's ed when I went through it. Uh, some of y'all maybe d don't remember there wasn't a thing as driver's ed other than get out in the pickup on the country roads. Is that, was that your driver's ed? And maybe on, a, maybe on an old tractor was driver's ed. But for me, we had the classroom part, and the classroom part was boring, but necessary, right? You've got to learn the rules of the road. What happens after that? You've got to go drive. And so the guy who uh, was leading our driver's ed, he was an interesting fellow, always showed up with a pipe, and, uh, which I thought was interesting, and he had a, like a tweed jacket. I looked at him like a professor, and he's teaching driver's ed. And uh, so, but one of the things he did, I, we drove five days in a row, and four out of those five days, we went to the bank. I don't know why you need to go to the bank four, four out of five days if you're a driver's ed teacher. But he, I think it was to make sure we could fit through that little narrow spot, right? See if we were paying attention well enough. But then he always asked for suckers for us. Remember when banks would have pass out suckers? The good days, right? The good days. Now they want to sell you a candy bar. I said, my bank used to give me a sucker. I don't know what y'all are doing. I'm going to pay a dollar for that candy bar, right? And I mean, you know, we got to get back to the times. <clears throat> the other thing he did one day, and I kept wondering why. I was in the back seat. This story is not about me. I was in the back seat, and he drove us past the hospital. We were in Goldsboro, North Carolina, and he drove us past Wayne Memorial Hospital. Wayne Memorial Hospital is on Wayne Memorial Boulevard, and there were uh, plenty of lanes, and he was driving us past, and I thought, why would he drive us past this on a test to see if we can drive? And then we all heard the siren. And I pretty well knew why he would drive us around the place where, it, you know, if you want to test what somebody's reaction is to a siren, what better place than to go to the hospital when you're more likely to see a siren and hear, see an ambulance and hear a siren. So we're out there, and we hear the siren, and there's a person who's driving, who I feel sorry for to this day, and I don't have any clue who it was. And the guy who was in the next, you know, the driver's seat over here, the next seat over, and then two of us in the back seat, and he asked them, the driver, he said, what do you do when you hear a siren? And the guy textbook said, right, you start slowing down, try to figure out where it's from, turn on your right blinker, get over to the right side, pull off if you can, right, get as far over as you can to make sure ambulance or, or, or fire truck or whatever can get, get by, and you slow down, and if you need to, you just go ahead and stop, and you wait until the, the ambulance gets by. He had all the right answers. Meanwhile, what was he doing? He kept going at 45 miles an hour staying in the left side of the lane 
and did not one of the things. He did not slow down. He did not seem to be caring as much about where the ambulance is coming from as to where the driver's ed teacher was talking to him. He did not turn on his blinker. He did not slow down and he did not get over. What do you think happened to him? What, what does it look like in life when you're really good in the classroom and you learn all the stuff up here, but then you get out into the real world and it's like you weren't paying attention at all in the classroom? But you can say it. Right? But it just doesn't come true. Well, I want to read back to you the passage from the Great Commission that we've been looking at. And here I want us to pick up a difference, right? There's a key statement. We talked about going, and as you're going, we're going to make disciples. We said that's not make Christians, but uh, it's, it's in a similar vein. Here I thought about it this way, right? A lot of people say, well, we need to just get people converted. And if they're converted and they're Christians, then we're okay. But he says make disciples. So we're we're supposed to talk to people and help them mature in Christ, right? And grow up a little bit. But being a disciple is, is a little bit higher and more important than just being a convert or just being a Christian. It's kind of like having a baby. You don't have a baby and say, okay, we had a baby, now we're done. What's left? How about let's raise that baby into an adult, right? And so it's not a matter of just getting people converted. We're, we're in the disciple-making business. And then we talked some last week about baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, how we have a constant need in our lives to surrender ourselves to Christ, to take away the old so that He can give us the new and give us the spiritual life, leaving behind our cares and concerns about everything physical and realizing there's a spiritual element to life and focusing on it. We have a grand inheritance in Jesus Christ. Then He says, teaching them. Now, how many of you grew up in school and the teacher was at the front of the school and she had information and you all were students and you sat in the desks and your job was trying to pick up as much information as you could. Teacher would talk, you would listen, right? Except what? Sometimes we know this, picking up the information is not the necessary part of it, right? If you talk to a surgeon and they say, I just graduated from school, and, and I've taken all the classes and I have all of the information up here. And you say, well, how many surgeries have you helped with? Well, no, 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 no. I just learned from the book. How many of you are going to say, okay, doc, I'm ready? What do we want from a surgeon? Not the person who knows, but the person who showcases what they know by what? By doing it well. By remembering all the different components. And so watch what Jesus doesn't say. He doesn't say teaching them to pass the Christianity 101 test. He doesn't say teaching them to have all the right beliefs. He doesn't do that. He says teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. So what is that observe part? If you go back and look, what you'll see is the observe part. When we observe a festival, what does that mean? It means we celebrate it. We do it. We go there. How do you all observe Christmas? Pull out the pamphlet, look up the Wikipedia, read the information about Christmas and say, ah, I got that Christmas thing down pat. No, how do you observe Christmas? Sing? How do you observe Christmas? Christmas tree? What's a big one? Buy presents. How do we celebrate the greatest gift of all coming down to this earth? We can sing, we can talk, we can listen, we can buy the Christmas tree, we can all celebrate. But one of the biggest ways we do that is we actually buy presents for other people. And we get presents from other people. We exchange gifts and we say, you know, this, this gift is a, in some way, shape, or form a symbol of the God, gift God gave to us. Uh, uh, you know, when he was born in a manger, baby Jesus. And so we, we transfer that down. It's not just that I know it, but it's that I know it and I observe it. And so what Jesus is saying here is that as we're carrying out the Great Commission, as we're making disciples, one of the best things that we can do, and we talked about this from you know, the scripture that I just read, he's saying teach these things to the generation and to the next generation and to the next. We have this idea that, that those of us who have something, it's not meant to end with us, but that we carry it on. And so he's telling the disciples to then make more disciples, Right? There's a scripture in Romans chapter 15. It's a pretty interesting scripture if you're looking at it. Uh, Chapter 15, verse 14. And this is Paul, and he's kind of concluding the the, the whole passage. He said a lot of things, but he's going to wrap up in the next chapter. 
he's almost wrapped up at the, 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 this chapter, and he's saying, I'm satisfied about you. He's telling the Roman church, my brothers, that you yourselves are full of goodness. Well, that's a good thing to be full of. And what it means is that what he's seen is that they have a reputation for doing what's right and being good to people. Right? So he's seen their reputation. They're full of goodness. How do you know somebody is? Because they've been doing good. And then he says they're filled with knowledge, which is a good thing. The filled with knowledge probably led to them being good and, and having a reputation for goodness, right? So knowing what to do probably leads to doing the right thing. But then he says what? You're also able to do what? So what does that mean? That means share what you have with somebody else. So how many of y'all have a tractor? How many of you ever taught anybody how to use a tractor? The first thing you need, tell me if I'm wrong, right, is in your house somewhere or in your barn somewhere to set up a classroom on everything tractor. Right? These are the front wheels, these are the back wheels, here's the steering wheel, you set up the design. That, somebody needs to take a test before they drive a tractor, don't they? Right? So you need a classroom. Before somebody drives a tractor, what do they need? Probably, probably a chalkboard so you could draw on it to teach. You have knowledge. You want to pass that knowledge along. Is that the best way to learn how to drive a tractor? When you're done with the classroom experience, you hand them the keys and you say, I'm going inside. What do we do? Huh? Yes. We say, okay, you're going to ride with me. I'm going to do this. You're going to watch. You know how to really teach somebody how to do something? The first one is, uh, I do it, you watch. The second one is, I do it, you help. The third one is, you do it, I help. And the fourth one is, you do it and I watch. At the end of that process, they've got it down. So the first time you say, okay, I'm going to drive. Here's where the stick shift is. See, watch me. I'm putting it into gear, right? Here's this. If you want to crash, don't learn anything about that pedal down there. You just keep going, right? Here's the throttle. It's up here. There's not a gas pedal down there. Some of them might have gas pedals now, I guess. But when I was learning, it was up here. And you had to crank it down, right? And you show them all the things. You, you know, maybe spinning the PTO is the last lesson, right? In, in terms of if you have something hooked up. But then what do you do? The way to tell somebody how to do it, the way to transfer that knowledge is what? You get out of that chair, right? And what? Time for them to get in it. And then you move over to the uncomfortable seat. Why do tractors not have two seats? No, I've never seen a tractor. Maybe some of them do, the big ones, you know. You've got a little, little buddy seat up here. Some of the combines maybe do, right? Because somebody, those new ones, they're running electronics and figuring out the yield per acreage and all that. that. Way beyond my pay grade, right? But at some point, to get somebody to do something they've never done, you've got to say, okay, it's your time, right? And so there's this passing along of knowledge that needs to happen. Now, what Paul, I think, is saying here is, hey, you, you, you've been able to do it, you know, and, and that's a good thing. And then he challenges them on something, and I think the challenge is good, right? He says, on some points I've written to you very boldly, by way of reminder, because of the grace given to me by God, that you need to be a minister of Christ Jesus to the Gentiles in the priestly service of the gospel of God, so that the offering of the Gentiles may be acceptable. So he's saying, at some point, you've taken care of each other well. And Paul is the best one to say, listen, Peter was called to be the head of the church. I'm called to be the lead disciple to everybody not in the church. At some point, we do things for those in the church, and it's great, and we carry on, and it's generational, and we do all that. At some point, our making of disciples, though, can go outside of the church and bring people who are not in the church into the church. Uh, Franklin Graham's video there is, what do we do with the unchurched? Well, how do we share with them the good news? Getting a box and filling it with love and offering it to people as a gift during the time of Christmas is a great way of doing that. But he says at some point, those who are in have a, a little bit of responsibility to look around. And so I ask you this question. If you've learned from people in your life... I think it's going to be kind of like my driver's ed class. You're going to have learned from people who were experts who stood at the front of a class and taught, and you sat and listened and learned, and that's an aspect of it. But I think there were also people who were willing to get in the next seat of the car and let you in the driver's seat and watch you do and help you learn on your own. And that there's almost two aspects to that. And, and so what I would argue is, one of the things that we can do to teach, it's not all about talking. 
If you want to learn how to teach well, sometimes the best thing you can do is stop talking and just maybe ask questions or stop talking and just lead by example, set an example. And so a lot of people have taken the Great Commission and said, that's not about me. I read the the statistics several times by now that they did a survey of people in church, right? Average church attenders, 51% were not familiar with the Great Commission. I think a lot of them read the going and say, well, I don't think God has called me to a foreign mission field. That's fine. It really says, as you go make disciples, so it's for everybody. I think a lot of people say, well, I'm not a teacher, and so I don't have to teach. We teach people every day. When you're doing something and people are watching, there's a lesson involved. What is that lesson? It might be, this person's a slacker. Don't follow their example. Right? If we're not applying this, one thing God says is, whatever you set your mind to do, do it for the glory of God. Why? Because, well, we don't know what we're doing and somebody's watching. And so so sometimes it can just be living your life as an example and letting other people follow. If you go back to Deuteronomy, it does involve some talking. Talk about things. Bring up faith. Tell your story. Tell why you're happy that God has done something for you today. Right? And, and, and that's what he's talking about, you know, reaching out to that priestly service. Sometimes it's just serving people. And then this is what Paul claims. He says, then in Jesus Christ, I have reason to be proud of my work. What was Paul proud of? He hadn't even really been to the church in Rome yet. He was headed there when he was under arrest. He was proud that he was writing to people who uh, he had instruction, information, knowledge that he was able to pass on. And what he says is, I'll be proud when they then learn to pass it on. Right? And so it's this multiple generational thing. Right? And so how does filled with all knowledge, I I don't want to miss that part. And as we kind of finish up here today, I want to grab that part and spend some time on it. What does being filled with the knowledge of God do for a person? So they did a study, and they talked about people who they classified as regular church attenders. Regular church attenders attended more than just once a month. So you can read that as two, three, four times a month. And then they asked them, they figured out who were the people who read this book four times a week. Not even every day, right? Not a regular quiet time, at least four times a day, and they came up with statistics, right? So people who went to church more than once a, a month, right, and, and, uh, and read the Bible four times a week, their feelings of loneliness dropped by 30%. What does knowledge of God do for you, right? It's, it's hard to be lonely when you read in the Bible that God is with you always, even to the ends of the earth. Right? What else dropped? Anger issues. Those who were reading the Bible said that their anger issues dropped by 32%. This is getting good. Relationship problems in general. The people who read the Bible four times. Why? You got relationship problems? Let's start in uh, 1 Corinthians 13 about love. Right? And, and sometimes I've had relationship problems and I didn't know the best way to handle it and so I just handled it in a, in a, a very immature way because that's the way I felt like handling it. And then I read one time where it said, uh, you know, if you don't have love, you're like a clanging gong. Have you ever been in a quiet place and there's a lot of noise and you wanted the noise to disappear? Do you want to be called that noise? You know? And so you're reading the Bible and it's changing you on the inside. And what's changing you when you adopt all of these positive things is that the old things can drop off, right? And so here's, here's a good one, right? Uh, they were doing the study, right? If you attended once a month or more, uh, read your Bible four times a week, the alcoholism reported by that group dropped by 57%. Feeling spiritually bored dropped by 60%. And this one's pretty interesting. Sharing your faith didn't drop, it jumped 200%. What, what, what in the world? The knowledge that you, you, my brothers, you yourselves are full of goodness and filled with all knowledge. What does this book offer? I think a lot of people look at this book And if they're living the life they want to live, they're not fully, you know, we talk about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. They're not fully surrendered to the power of the Holy Spirit. They don't want to read this book because they think this book's going to tell them not to do something they think is a lot of fun doing. Right? 
Or maybe they think it's old advice that's not worthy anymore. And yet statistic after statistic after statistic says that if you want to have a quality life, the more you know about what God shares with us in this book, the better off you're going to be. And yet the statistics about people who are full of the knowledge of God, right, who have been in a situation where people above them are teaching them to observe all of these things. I've had people come up to me and say, Pastor, I really ruined my life. And I said, how? They started listing things. And I'm like, I'm sorry, but we've broken three of the Ten Commandments already. What, what, are, you, what are you doing here? The basics of life, of the basics of the Word of God, can help us out in so many ways, right? That this book is a key to the heart of God, a key to what He wants us to do, to, to be able to live that full spiritual life. And if we understood that it's not meant, right, to, to tell us where we've gone wrong, but it's meant to tell us where to go right, right? It's meant to teach us about God. And it does tell us, don't, don't make a left turn here, because that's not the right way. And if we were to follow these, the happiness that would be involved, the blessing on our life that would be involved, and yet so many times, what do we do? We just leave it sitting. I have a quick question. There's a lot of messages that are kind of like God loves you and it's wonderful and there's no, no real response except to just you know, continue to let that drill into your heart to know that God loves you. Out of all the messages, if there is one that has practicality, it's focusing on the knowledge that we need to have, right? He says, you yourselves are filled with all knowledge and are able to... Uh, able to instruct one another. The Great Commission says, you're to teach them to observe all that I've commanded you. So parents in the room are teaching their children. It, one of the things I learned one time, I had a professor who uh, didn't know as much as they claimed to know. They were trying to teach, but they didn't quite. It, it's hard to teach it to the next ones if we don't already have it to teach. Right? And so, um, how many of y'all, if you had to teach your children about um, driving a tractor, would go up somewhere in the city limits and find somebody there and ask them if they had any tractor experience because you, you needed somebody to tutor your kids because you didn't have time. Right? But now, if you want to teach them how to drive a tractor, right, you find a farm with an old tractor looks like it's been ridden. You find out who rode it. Right? And then you say, would you teach me? What if we, this is a bad example, my old Bible's falling apart, I bought a brand new one, leather, it's nice, right? But what if we wanted to learn somebody who could disciple us? What if we looked around and we found the person with the most worn out Bible? What does it have to teach me? There's so much in here. So what's the practical response to this? Well, I just read some statistics about people who went to church at least once a month. It's October 1st, you're there already. Congratulate yourself. Pat yourself on the back. You're in the club already, right? But the next thing is people who read the Bible at least four times a week. I wonder if somebody would, and I, you know, I'm just arrogant enough to ask people to raise their hand. There's no eye closed. There's none of that. If you, if you accept my challenge, we're going to do it in front of everybody. Would you be willing to say today, I'm going to let, make you do it before I can even let you go out to lunch, so, so I'm, I'm tricking you, Right? Would you be willing to say so that God can give me all the knowledge I need so that I can pass it along? I'm going to commit today to reading the Bible at least four times next week. Four times. It's not even every day. Four times. Pick a chapter, read it. If you don't know where to start, Gospel of John's a wonderful place. Gospel of Matthew's a wonderful place. All of the Gospels are a wonderful place. Psalms, you know, you can get some great things. If you want to learn some more wisdom, Proverbs. If you want to start from the beginning, you can start from the beginning. I know a lot of y'all have done a reading through the Bible plan, and it went well in January when you were in Genesis, but when it kicked into Deuteronomy and Leviticus and all of those others, what happened? February was dry. February is tough. Oh my goodness, you know what? You can cheat, you can jump to the New Testament and start in Matthew, 
right? And you can get the gospel of Jesus Christ. So what do we do? We're going to make Paul proud. We're going to be people who have the knowledge but are also able to pass along the knowledge. It doesn't mean that we're responsible for all of it, but it means we each have a price to pay and we each have a lesson to teach and we're going to come together as a body of Christ and do this together. I think that this passage, and we're going to talk about the last sentence next week, go therefore, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all I have commanded you, and behold, I am with you always to the end of the age, is a super important thing for us to, get, to be aware of and to know. We have a task, that we have a mission from Jesus till now. Let's stand for a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we are grateful for today for the gospel message, the saving uh, grace of Jesus Christ who did something phenomenal for us. Help us to see that a very integral part of our faith is passing it along. Not keeping it, not holding fast to it, but sending it to the next generation, sending it to the next person who's next to us wherever we happen to be, wherever we're going. And that we, we do that sometimes just by living our lives the way you'd have us to do it. Maybe that opens up opportunities to speak a word here and a word there, telling people about how faithful you are, even in the difficult times. And we know there are people right now going through difficult times. Help us to be strong as a community, but help us to be dedicated to your mission. Bless us, go with us, give us all the things that we need. We pray for in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. And all God's people said.